Morning. Hang on. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? All right? Yes. Perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Yeah, it's fine. No worries. So thank you, first of all, for finding time for this in the first place, because I know you're a busy man. So, <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, just starting with the other stuff, because mm -hmm. we wanted to make a statement against the music at the time in late 70s. And then you used the sound as a weapon just to annoy people. And I'm, my question would be, do you still use your music till this day sort of as an art, anti-art, anti-music sort of vehicle or you just make music for the sake of making music? Um, I think I've slipped a little bit more into the latter uh, of uh, making music. I mean, we've uh, nothing's changed in the sense that I've always made sounds and music and, and, and things that I do for my own volition. I do it for my own volition, for my own reasons, and I do it. It's not for an audience specifically. Um, it's you know, it's done with my own intentions and for my own wishes. So it's not changed. But in terms of the nature of that music, I think I can't ignore what's happened to me in the last forty years either. And so, therefore, what has happened is that. Um, not only have I changed and grown and the influences and everything around me have changed, but also I think people's perceptions of me have. And so therefore I can't ignore everything that I've done and where I've been. So I can't, I don't ignore it, nor do I want to repeat it. So I, even though, so it's a little bit of a get out answer in the sense that um, I probably don't, I don't feel that my music will shock i don't think music does shock in the way it did and we were able to do it say in the in the 70s and we were able to do things with sound that that did kind of you know probably did jolt people um we approached it in that way but people are much more sophisticated and we live in an information world everybody knows everything now so the capacity to to shock in or the capacity to really throw people is diminished because People are so much more knowledgeable. People do under, are capable of understanding so much. So I don't think there's an overt idea of, oh, I'm doing this because people have never heard anything like this before and this will really kind of be quite different for them. That world, is, that world has gone, really, I think, and, and for so many, many reasons. You know, one, because of audiences are much more um, knowing about things, but also we live in a market economy and anything that shocked or anything that's kind of a shift in, in, in anything culturally, creatively or artistically and with sound, anything that has sort of been a shift has always been co-opted by markets. And so, you know, the example, the obvious example being that it probably took about nine months or six months for, you know, the shock of punk or what, if for people who thought that, to be soon absorbed into a market and it became a series of, you know, signs and designs and sounds everything gets brought into a market thing so i think we have to be aware of the fact that our capacity to do new things is just about recontextualizing things rather than feeling it's new so i think i just carry on making music uh, i can only make music that i want to make and like to make um but whether i feel it has the impact it did back 40 years ago no it can never do that and I, that's partly me and partly the world so yeah Obviously, in the late 70s, it was, as you said, it was like shocking and people haven't heard it before. And then if something shocks the industry, it employs it and kind of sucks those ideas in. And yeah. I think there's like a lot of, like obviously a lot of what you did in the late 70s now is part of the mainstream music. Uh, are you happy how the current music sort of employed those ideas and how they use concrete sound and how they use experimental techniques? Or you are a bit like, I think sometimes it's a bit tacky. What is your kind of... Um, so it's a really interesting question that because I think there's so much brilliant music being made and I think people are still massively creative and inventive within that. I think some of the things that we played with have probably been absorbed, but I think some of those ideas, you know, I mean, I'm here in Brighton and working with kind of younger artists um, and their capacity to almost un unknowingly create really fascinating and, and new kind of pieces is is brilliant. Um, I, I think perhaps none of it is particularly new. We're all very aware of it, but the new context and the new juxtapositions of things 
that I find fascinating. And the way people put things together different. All we were doing was, you know, we weren't, we were using sounds that could be created and putting them together in this particular way. The way we put them together was very different. And that difference was the thing that got as a reputation or notoriety. I think the way people are putting things together, it's not, it's still not, it's not boring. There's still really interesting things going on. I think the thing that's probably changed is that technology has made the process of doing things much more accessible and easier. You know, it's sort of, if we wanted to, you know, just, just using, you know, using our stuff as an example, if, if we wanted to kind of use found sounds or whatever, it would be the process of using tape recorders and all this kind of stuff and using primitive kind of modular synths to make analog synths to make weird noises. And then we did it. Nowadays, you know, it's really easy. You can do it on your phone with an app. So, and, and that's interesting. Uh, so, it really it comes back down to the same thing. It's about the ideas and the energy and the dynamic that people put into it. So the difference is always going to be people. And um, I think the fascinating thing is there are each generation. There's just di different ways of people doing things. But I do I do think it's fascinating. I'm not jaded and I'm not bored, mm -hmm. uh, and I do love that. You've got to know what your craft is and what your instruments are and what your own practice is. And my own practice does involve kind of electronics. It involves synths, but it in incorporates my voice as well. And I tend to put that together in a way which is not, you know, I do it in so many different ways. And so, you know, that that's my thing. That's what I do. But um, other people are doing interesting things every day, and it's fascinating. I'm, you know, I love the fact I'm able to kind of see and hear that. I think the thing that has changed probably is the industry and I think that worries me in the sense that for musicians particularly sound artists that's why sound art, or artists who work in sound I won't say sound art I will say artists who work in sound are probably in a stronger position in the sense that they don't they don't come in with a, an idea of a mass you know you don't no one really expects to make money out of music but it's really sad when no one does make money out of music. And I think that's, so for a lot of musicians, and I see a lot of amazing artists and musicians and people or peers, people who are younger than me, how much of a struggle it is now to get, to get, you know, get a return. And I think that's really bad artists just as much as anyone, anyone who works should see a return for their efforts and their labor and all their the work that they put in. And I'm just finding it really sad, I suppose, that we have now have a, a system where through streaming and through access and all those kinds of things, where people are just content providers. And I find that, a little, you know, I see it myself. It's quite disturbing in the sense that, you know, you bring out, I bring out a lot of music and then, you know, you always get the feeling of people, oh, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. And then they just move on to the next thing. So there's no sustainability in the model of music as it is at the moment. I don't know whether it will change, but I think that's the thing that's a little bit disheartening that is that, music is is a difficult thing for people to actually get rewards for their efforts and their work but hey that's 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 the arts it's never been massively funded and particularly in in the way we work in this country which seems to have so little respect for you know creative people and creative practices yeah actually like probably the gap has deepened between the emerging artists and sort of and already popular artists like in terms of how much they're getting paid i think in like last century i feel like it was a bit more balanced than it is now because obviously so many people are getting their music out in streaming platforms every day it's like i don't know it's like sixty thousand songs being put out so it's just fighting for attention instead yeah. of actually listening what new stuff people coming up with it's just people looking for something familiar and then sort of concentrating on that, which is quite scary because then it's easy to fixate on the same things. And then... It's not an easy one to resolve. And, and we're also looking at it from a perspective of a maker of music, but also we're all users of, you know, we're all consumers of music and we're all... It's, it's just the way that... This is literally the way the world has led us. The technology, you know, we created these technologies and they, this is the, the natural pathway that's taken us there. It's, it's not a good or bad world. It's just the inevitability of that world which we created. But um, it, it does drill back down to the fact that music in some ways seems to have become much more of a utility than anything else. And people regard it as something that's 
you know, it's omnipresent, it's everywhere, you know, and people can just switch it on like like electricity or like, like water. Although, ironically, we're reaching the point where water and electricity are more, far more expensive and far, more, far much more of a, a kind of a contested sort of uh, resource than music is. But it's like I say, that's just the way the world's gone and we live with that. But I think we have to then come back and go, the, the other great part of, of music, of sound and being creative is the making and no one can take that away from us. If we can make music, it's joy, you know, or we can make art, it's joy. If we can then turn that, monetize that in some ways, which is we're always trying to do because people want to survive and they should be able to survive making music. That's the difficult bit, but I still believe we all do it because we enjoy doing it. Yeah. That's a bit of a cop out though, in the sense mm-hmm. that that's why people exploit is because they go, are oh, we well, doing this because you like it anyway? It doesn't really matter whether you get paid, does it? And that's the bullshit we've got to kind of like turn away from really. Yeah. 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 It's quite interesting because like, obviously in this, age you could do whatever you want and then it seems like there's a sort of a scene for like every single type of music me and Maya we even sometimes fall in the cracks and actually uh going to the remix you did for us and then you send the you, you asked if you could do whatever you want with the vocals and stuff and then we were like oh yeah sure do, you do whatever you want and then you send us with like a bunch of layers and I remember sitting there being like wow this is crazy I was like I really like it I, I was like I want to get like on the radio and stuff and I don't see <laughs> like, like it probably will be too crazy i feel like this was this will fall into the cracks of like yeah between the two scenes and it's really somehow um, it annoys me a bit because like it seems like you, in this age you could do whatever you want but you still sort of have to fall into certain boxes and uh, yeah it's quite frustrating and then coming back to the remix i wanted to ask you what was your sort of what drawn you to the project and what was your approach to making it happen I mean, the first, the first thing being is I'd heard the stuff, previous stuff that you guys have done, and I play it and listen to it. My wife and I listen to it in the car, and I love the stuff you do, and I love the vocals that you have. I love the whole kind of feel, and it, it, it's such, you know, it's got such beauty and a delicate touch to it as well, and I, there's just so many things in there, but it's also very, you know, it's very visceral, and you can feel it. It's lovely. So I knew your music, and so it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to go on this. And then <laughs> to set the... The answer to the second bit of the question is kind of funny because it goes back to your first question. Do I still sort of surprise people with my music? And clearly I do because <laughs> uh, I got you and Maya with it, which is fine. And it wasn't what you wanted. It's it's interesting. It's interesting. You're quite right. You wanted a remix and it, it needed to have value to you. But to be quite honest, I just love the intertwining of voices. It became this kind of hypnotic kind of wash of voices. And so I started off working with the voices. And as you quite rightly, and, and you know, it's it's difficult when you do remixes because you go, yeah, you can do what you want. But then at the same time, you, you you know, it is your piece of work and you do you do want to feel represented in it. And you quite rightly went, Mal, it's too mad. Turn it down a bit, a little bit. <laughs> You need a car. As someone said about, um, I can't remember which producer, oh, he he needs a calm down plug-in and I needed a calm down plug-in to calm it down a little. <laughs> uh, I did then come back and sort of structure the vocals so it wasn't all flying. But I, I actually, it was the voices that drew me to it. I love the idea of the voices just weaving in and out of each other, like this kind of, yeah, it was almost like a lattice work of voices and that's what I, that's what I did like. And it was probably just my reaction to I got the stems and went, I don't know what voice, which bit of voice to use, actually. And then went, oh, I like the idea of flying, you know, just interweaving them. So that was the first approach. And then quite rightly, to bring it back to something that, is, that people can connect with and not confuse them too much. So I stripped that back, back down. And also just in the nature of, you know, I think because of the stuff I've been doing in recent years, does, it is very rhythmic music. It is very minimal tech uh, and bass lines and drums and things like that. And that's what I've been doing, and I enjoy that. So I figured I would work with what I've been, you know, that probably that kind of bit of the idea, the idea of what I've been doing in recent times with that. So I just played with those ideas, and also as a remix to give it something that had, you know, a rhythm and skeleton, a structure of rhythm and bass going through it. And that was it, really. So I think hopefully I got there in the end for you. But yeah. I mean, we were very happy with it. So yeah, I even like the first 
the drop, but that was just a bit like, it was just my own kind of like, oh, will this work? I don't know. So it was a bit of a confusion, but yeah. it's. Well, it's also, I wanted to do the reverse of what people tend to do. I wanted to invert it because when we do remixes, and I've done, I've done even further with some remixes where we go, we'll take a bit of vocal and then we'll write the rest. And I've even replaced people's vocal with my own vocal and given them a read. There's people out there today who think it's their vocal and it's not, it's mine. But, but I thought I wanted to invert that idea of just taking a tiny bit, you know, a four bar of vocal, you know, a couple, you know, maybe a couple of four bar bits of vocal and then just making a track out of it. I wanted to go, no, I want to take all the vocals. <laughs> But that, I love the fact there was dialogue and I could talk to you and you do know me and you know I'm, I'm quite happy to sort of go, okay, let's try this again. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, and that was it. But it was to probably give it, knowing the fact you wanted a remix and it does feed into the third part of your comment, which is you wanted the remix to give something that maybe could give people a connection. And I think I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a songwriter. I work in sound, so therefore I'm not going to turn it into a song, but I can turn it into a bit more, if not clubby, certainly a more rhythmic track. So that was my role in, as a remixer to give you that that kind of framework to hang it from. But I, I wasn't going to structure it into a song or anything like that. That's your job. You've done it. So it was either going to be incredibly ambient or it had breaks in it. But I'm a, I love rhythm, I love drums, and I'm a bass player, so that's what I did. Brilliant. Do you still, it's a bit more on the technical side, do you still use sort of like a hybrid uh, instrument, so kind of mixture of inbox or computer software and out gear, or do you do all of it in, 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 in Ableton or whatever you use? Well, I actually quite like, because what I wanted to do was not, I wanted to wanted it to be programmed rather than played. If you know what I mean? I didn't want to go, oh, I'm going to play keys, I'm going to play this, I'm going to do that. I wanted to program it. So I used Ableton and, you know, Max for Live and did it like that. And and, and I do like some of the I, I, I do that sometimes. I work in two ways. One, when I work at home, I work, I build it around Ableton uh, and then use external stuff. And then when I do other stuff, I go into our analog studio down in Cornwall. So I, I go from extreme studio conditions of everything, modulars, every mod, you know, everything there to just stripping it down. And when, because I was actually, uh, I wasn't able to go into the studio, I was at home. I just went, I just want to write it as a programmed piece. So I didn't play anything. It was all programmed in. Uh, and that was my approach to doing it. So I did it. And also just to play with those, those some of those sounds and, and be able to tweak them. So I did it very much in the box, this one. And I don't have a problem with that. I've done a few remixes for people. It's totally programmed and in the box. It gives it a kind of, I think it gives it more of a, it gave it more of a mechanical structure to it, which I, which is what I wanted rather than it feel, I didn't want to go, oh, I'm going to do a group, play a groovy bass line here. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go, no, I want to make this kind of quite mechanical in, in, in structure. And so I just programmed it in. So it was done in Ableton, yeah. So as a sound person, do you quite often base your music on some sort of gear? So you kind of pick a gear and then sort of experiment around it? Or mm. do you do that quite often? We do we have we do do that with the Wrangler stuff and with the creep show stuff because we have access to so much stuff and and because I work with Benji in the studio I've just come back I've been back um, working down there and it was very much that process of oh what's that sound like and we get really fa we have favorite instruments that we will work with and and I think this time round what was I using um, I was using. Uh, strangely enough, I was using a, a strange chroma keyboard uh, on some of this stuff. Quite a rare uh, 80s um, Yamaha bass, bass synth, which very few people had, but it's a really kind of like, it's like we'll use that SHO one. We use a lot of the sounds if we want to create sounds, we'll use a Moog modular to create kicks and snares. So we go to particular instruments, but also, the, you know, there'll be times when a piece of equipment has just come into the studio because Bench has just acquired it, and we'll go, oh, wow, you know, we'll use that. I've not seen this. I just spent a week using uh, one, the original called Polysynth, which is a really old-fashioned one, where it's great because they're called Travelers, where all the filters, they're not on knobs, they're on, like, horizontal sliders so yeah i mean you, you get you know i love it you get a bit of equipment you go oh, i want to play with this i want to play with this and then i love the idea of a, a piece of technology having its own 
character and personality and you work with that you know so we do we do pick up on things uh, and uh, go let's push this to its limits and tend to use that you know so um so technology can sometimes drive things we have an idea of what we want but sometimes uh, you let the technology help shape that sound and that's great which is really good yeah because you have your solo album coming out in 15th of July so take, yeah. take a look I believe it's called yeah. and then you mentioned somewhere that you will will try to base all of the vocals and the whole album around the 90s sampler S750 yeah. I believe did yeah. you manage to do that or you kind of we I kept it going for a bit we probably used it on it was the start of about five tracks six tracks mm -hmm. it, it probably fell away on a couple of them but yeah it was that idea because I think when you do an album also trying to keep some sort of overall kind of feel to it. And so therefore one piece of technology, if it links through to a few tracks can help give a, a level of connection and uniformity to, to the sound that you're doing. So yeah, we did. And also I was into a lot of really slowed down stuff. And so it, it was great to be able to do that. So using that, the, using the role of the stereo sampler was, was the start of quite a few things. Yeah. But, I mean, I did use a lot more equipment on that. I mean, the previous one on Dada, I'd literally said I wanted to do it just with a drum machine and an organ and a couple of bass machines to play bass line. I wanted to go back to what I thought was an interesting time of creative electronic music and, you know, the whole Detroit sound, which was really based on minimal technology because all those guys had very little technology. So, you know, you're talking 909 drum machine, a sampler and, you know, not much else, um, you know, and at organs in some cases. So I pulled it back to, to doing that and going, let's make music with a, simple, a much simpler palette. I think it's worthwhile because whether you're working with Ableton or you're working in a, the studio I work in, we, we have too much choice. And I think, it, you know, creativity is lost when there's too much choice because it becomes you know, whatever bit of gear you pick up next becomes the novelty of what you're doing. Whereas it, but restricting yourself to a limited palette of sounds is far more interesting to try and do, you know, rinse, rinse those sounds out and make something good with them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then obviously, like, you, over the years, you've worked on multiple uh, collaborative projects and you mentioned in quite a few interviews that you really like collaborations. What do you like most about working with other creatives? I think it. I think it's in part in my nature. I'm quite a sharing person, and I so I actually enjoy. I mean, I enjoy working on my own, but also, I find sometimes I find solid working solitary rather soul, not soulless, but it's a bit you know. I, but I much more enjoy having that shared experience with people, and you know, you play roles and you can bounce off each other. So I actually like the you know that dynamic and that chemistry. Um, so I do enjoy working on my own, but I often feel quite lonely when I've done stuff on my own because I've got no way of understanding it as much. And I don't, I'm not a person who needs massive gratification from going, I did that. If it's good, it's good. And I have a part in it. That's cool. You know, and I've done so many things that I like to think, oh, well, I have, I'd, it is a work, it is a process that does work and it does work for me because I have lots of friends who find collaboration really, really difficult. You know, it doesn't work for them. I mean, it's funny, I work with Lone Lady and she she's called Lone Lady because she can't work with anyone else. And I work with Richard who, you know, who found it, he only ever really worked with me from Cabaret Voltaire. We had worked together, but some people find it difficult to work, although they both worked with me, which I find quite funny. <laughs> so I guess it's in my nature really. Um, and, I, and I do enjoy it, but I do understand, I do understand the idea of, I know what I want it to sound like. I, I don't want to. I don't want other people to sort of change or affect that. I'm kind of in that a little bit at the moment because I've got lots of people asking me to do. They want to do remixes of the new new album and everything, and I'm going. I kind of don't. That's not collaboration for me. I don't really need my work reinterpreted. I prefer to work with people, and that's why it was good working with you because you bounced back and went, "No, I'll do this, do that," and I like that. Um, and and so maybe I maybe it's good for me. It, it's it works for me quite well. So and I'm in that process of going. No, I don't really want anyone to do any remixes of this. I quite, this is what I wanted to do. So for me, I've got to be careful because I have had so much stuff coming out in the last sort of six months 
I think it starts to get kind of quite murky when it's like, oh, Mal's done this, Mal's done that, or Mal's working with this person. It's like, I've, certain things you just want to go, I'll keep that. My own, the stuff with my own name on, I've just kept simple. Anything else is open. But if it's got my name on, it's just me. When do you feel like it's the right time to sort of end the collaboration in a way? If it's like a longer term, the time to move on to the next one? I think, well, to be quite honest, Guido, that I think a lot of them are quite specific in the, in the sense that that I work with people who are also tending to be to do other things and so we go that they're, they're kind of almost like a lot of the the collaborative things I do are quite they're either long-standing ones and they go on for years or they are one-offs and they're just kind of specific things that I do so I've just done the Mark Stewart one uh, which was just Mark's got an album out and he said would you do something with it you know And I was like, oh, yeah, because it's the last record Lee Scratch Perry ever made, you know. So it's like I've kind of got to show respects to that. It was just a one-off. Um, whereas with, I mean, I'm, the other person who's on that record is Eric Randon. Eric and I have been working together since 1978. And we'll be do, we're doing something, big thing in Manchester next year together. So I think... I, in some ways, they're not as much collaborations as relationships I have with people. And we pick them up and run with them for a bit and then we go off and do other stuff and then come back. So I've never been in a situation where I've well, not really felt this is a collaboration in it. I work with people who I know, love and respect in m most occasions. So they tend to be things that, you know, I will pick up again later on. Then again, stuff like Wrangler as well. You know, I've been working, I've known Phil since 1982 and, and we've been doing Wrangler now and working as Wrangler and as Creepshow and as various sort of things, the three of us, we've been doing that for 12 years now and we've got two more albums ready to come out. So yeah, that just goes on basically. That That's just a long standing thing. But I think you also, I think they tend to be project based. So we'll do an album or we'll do tracks or like I did in the 12 inch with Silent, uh, Silent Servant. They're just one offs. And also people come to me a lot. I mean, to be quite honest with you, For every collaboration I do, I've turned down three. You know, people want me. I think people know me as sort of someone who likes to work with people. And so, you know, I do get asked quite a lot. But I don't always say yes. I only say yes to certain things. I think it's not so a matter of how I know it's when it's finished. It's a question of how I know it's the right thing to start. Brilliant. Yeah, I think that's more or less all I wanted to ask. But yeah, thank you so much for your time. I give my love to Maya as well, okay? Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you very much. See you later, Mel. See you later. Take care. Good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.